All right, so that's me. I have some awesome kids. Um, I'm a husband, Nova Hacker. I don't know if you guys know what that is, and also Marine. So why are we here? Just shout it out. Why is anybody here? Learn. learn. We got learn. What? <laughs> Nothing. We're just, we're just here to sit in chairs. All right. Got it. To steal laptops? Awesome. So before I get into EMET, um, I put this together because when I was doing all these pen tests, I would do the pen test, I'd give the report, and then the person who got the report, the CISO or whoever got it, they'd go, okay, how do I fix these things? Okay, I told them how to fix these things. Which box do I buy to fix these things? Um, there really isn't a box. There's no, there's no wonderful solution that comes and you pay for it. Most of the things are free. Who's here heard of EMET? Good, more hands than normal. This is awesome. So EMET is, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically this free tool that is like a memory bouncer. So he stands in front of this, this all this memory that your Windows machine has and says, no, it's not gonna happen. The great thing about this is that it's operating at a level where most people don't really think about. So you have buffer overflows, for instance. A buffer overflow, what it does, and most of you guys know this, I'm not trying to tell you something that you don't already know, is it starts with a problem in a piece of software. Once that piece of software has a problem in it, someone throws a bunch of stuff in it, and it does some other stuff. Well, the problem is that once it has that code execution, once you have, like, where the bad guy is controlling things, that's the problem, not the software. So EMIT actually protects against this using some things like forced DEP, uh, SEHOP, ASLR, and all, all these different protections. So EMIT has all of these amazing protections on it, and you can apply it via GPO, and this is free. So you got all of this cool stuff. It stops all of the memory corruption bugs. It stops ODAs. It's great. But you can bypass it, right? There's all these talks and stuff about bypassing EMET. Here's another one. And you can, you can take a picture of that QR code, load it up. I, it's fine. You can trust me. We just talked about trust, right? But the problem with the, all the EMET bypasses that I've seen out there is they bypass one or two or three pieces of or protections that EMET does. Well, depending on now, so depending on the buffer overflow or the or the exploit or so, that can mean one of two things. They can either bypass some of them, and it, and that particular application is either not protected by EMET or it is, and it's only um, adding a couple of these protections, or they have to bypass all of them, or a bunch of them. So that's really hard. If I am an attacker, how much money do you think I'm gonna spend on getting into your organization if I can just spam everyone and get into a bunch of organizations? Not much, unless I'm going after something very specific. So EMET is not the 100% solution, it's the 90% solution. You can get 90% of drive-bys and watering hole attacks and all that stuff that's going on right now with one free tool. You don't have to worry about patching, you can, you can stop patching. How's that? Does that work for everyone? Yeah? No. So EMET, we got that for free from Microsoft, and that's Microsoft stuff, and that's Windows stuff. Well, what about Java? Most of the Java things, and, and unfortunately I'm saying this on camera, so whatever, um, most of the Java things are, are problems that Sun created or Mr. Ellison created or uh, Oracle created or stuff like that. Anyways, um, so Java has problems that aren't buffer overflows. They're stupid 
problems in, in uh, permissions or stuff like that. So how do you, how do you stop Java? Anyone have a? Uninstall. Uninstall. Yeah, that's a great one. So I put up these uh, that I, I normally get. You just patch it. Because that works. Everyone, let's just patch Java all the way up to the newest version. We'll be good, right? Yeah. It really doesn't work in a, in a developer situation. How about let's disable the plugin in GPL. Let's just make it so that there's all of the stuff doesn't work. That works. Or the final one, everyone should just run Linux, because Java doesn't work on Linux, right? All right. So everyone knows what this is? This is what all of your users send to every website that they go to. What version of .NET they're running, what version of InfoPath, and all that. This is all this, this is called a user agent. If you haven't seen a user agent before, it's in HTTP traffic. And the crazy thing about this is that this user agent is used on all of the websites that it goes to, but when it sees Java code, when something is written in Java for a web application, it does something weird. It sends all of that stuff. Microsoft or whatever um, browser you use says, I don't know how to do anything with this. Here, Java plugin, you do it. And that Java plugin sends this across. It says, hey, Java, I'm going to go through the proxy and, and I'm going to request this thing. But it sends it with a user agent that's way different than the one that it uses in the browser. Java WS 1.6.09 or 029. Anyone know what, uh, what exploit works for that? How about 1.6.26? 1.7.04? All right. Anyways, those Java user agents are, are going across the wire. So why not do something about it? So this is how it looks. And this is what I, uh, I suggest to people. Block Java at the firewall, or at the proxy. You can, you can block it very simply by going into your proxy and saying, hey, if it has this Java user agent, don't allow it through. Does that work for everyone? Ah, you guys are dead. It's too early in the morning, right? It's Monday. <laughs> Good excuse. All right. So if the user never gets to this prompt, then you win. You never give them the option to click run, because people like Dave Kennedy have signed their stuff, and they have the option to you know, click run. So let's just not give them that option. Would, would you trust all of your users to, to, to sign code in, in your organization? Always. Always. Nice. So this is how I suggest doing it. There's two ways. One, you can completely block all Java user agents at your firewall and only allow specific exceptions through. This has worked at very large organizations already doing this. Or you can just block on the version. So like I showed in earlier, that Java user agent shows you exactly what version it's going. The way that I found that, I ran phishing exercises and saw, hey, this Java user agent's getting shown up. Let me send them that exploit. This one's going to, let me send them that exploit. So see that red? This is also free. So stop exploits of the browser, and they can't monitor. Oh, yeah, so that last bullet. There is no way that I know of, and I've asked a lot of people, that a attacker can change the Java user agent before the exploit kicks off. So they have to use that Java user agent. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They have to use it if they are pulling down code. Now, if they start chaining stuff like a flash to Java uh, and stuff like that, that might change things. But I haven't seen anyone use that yet. So um, after I posted a blog post on how to do this with Squid, there's a guy named Z on Reddit that said, hey, this works in SSL too. So 
user agent is sent across proxies that use SSL. So now not, not only am I blocking all of the memory corruption bugs with EMET, unless they bypass 30, 40 of them, I'm blocking all of the Java blo uh, uh, problems with, with my proxy, even if the attacker decides to use SSL on their website and try and encrypt everything, I still block it. Cool stuff? Yeah, blah, blah, it's Monday. <laughs> oh yeah, and it helps with Macs too. How many people, just as a, uh, as a uh, show of hands, how many people in their organization have Macs on their network right now? Keep your hands raised. How many of you guys, put it down if you don't, have group policy or, or central management of those Macs? Every hand went down except for these two. So, <laughs> all right, so we've blocked all of these things with memory and corruption. We've blocked all of this Java stuff. How many phishing um, exploits or targets can you think of that aren't in those two groups? Zero. So now I've solved all of your client, uh, client exploitation problems, right? All right. So the next topic I want to talk about is, is kind of one that's been beat to death on every other talk that I've ever seen. First one one that I don't see very many people talking about, is if PWDump is removed from your IS box in your DMZ, is that the end of the solution? Is like, if, if, if your AV guy comes up to you and says, hey, all of these things got removed, you're like, great, job well done? No, if it got there somehow, it just, PW dump doesn't just magically appear on IIS boxes unless Chris John Riley puts it there. Um, so let's, let's start working on getting all of the actively removed things looked at and, and assessed. Log on alerting. How many people in this room right now have something in their enterprise that logs and alerts on successful log on attempts? Two, three, BS. You're just raising your hand now. <laughs> so AD Audit Plus, and this is the only one that I know of that's paid in this whole talk. AD Audit Plus is the only tool that I've ever seen that does this, because I was on a pen test, and I had successfully fished into this organization, got in, I started using the local admin hash, and got, found the domain admin, started using the domain admin to authenticate to other places. I used that authentication three times. AD Audit Plus sent an email to the domain admin, or a text message to the domain admin. Domain admin responded to that text message, change password. His password was instantly changed on the domain controller from his cell phone. The local admin that I also used was also changed automatically, and I was dead in the water, and all of the logons that I had done were reported to him via email. In a matter of minutes, I was dead in the water. So AD Audit Plus is, one, is the tool that I, uh, he said that he used to do that, which is amazing. Um, I haven't seen anyone else do that. Um, I'm sure you can do it with Splunk and every other thing that uh, Rafi would tell us about. Um, HIPS. Now, this is a little bit of a sensitive part for me. How many people in here have some kind of host intrusion prevention system on their computers right now. That's kind of hard. There's like five hands. All right. How many people in their organizations actually enable the prevention part, not just logging? And there's two hands. So we got five down to two. All right. So it's really hard for someone to enable host intrusion prevention, actual prevention part, because those signatures can run the gamut, and, and sometimes they actually target themselves like McAfee's. Um, so how do you do this effectively? Well, remember the PW dump example? 
how about let's just turn on categories? Like, if it's a hacker tool, let's enable the prevention on that. Ignore the, re uh, log all of the other, you know, signatures and stuff that it detects. Let's just enable the prevention on hacker tools, like Netcat, evil Netcat. Damn, it's Monday. All right, vulnerability scanning. How many, how many in this room are pen testers? Okay. How many vulnerability assessments people? Not one. <laughs> no one wants to, <laughs> no one wants to raise their hand. That's awesome. So vulnerability assessments, uh, basically vulnerability scanning. How many, how many in this room have done a vulnerability scan? How about that? All right. How many people that have done that vulnerability scan have looked through every single one of those results? Three, four, awesome. Now, the problem I see here is this is becoming more and more common. As more people, more organizations do vulnerability scanning by default, they hire people to do those who then generate the reports, give them to the people who own those machines and say, fix these. How effective is that? Right. So vulnerability scanning is, is what the tool does, and we need more people in, in that go into those results and say, PHP CGI vulnerability that is in this module that's never enabled, not important. Oracle vulnerability that nobody publishes information on and can't ever be exploited. Yeah, I see some people laughing. They know how it is. So we need people in front of this. We need people doing vulnerability reporting instead of just sending off this stupid little report that gets generated by the damn thing. Um, and if your organization doesn't have someone to do that, if they just have the person that pushes their button and does thing, you know, gives it off, get your pen testers involved. I guarantee every single pen tester would love to see your vulnerability scan. Wow. All right, moving on. Crowdsourcing security. Um, everyone knows what crowdsourcing is, right? Yeah? Okay. So crowdsourcing security is, is, a, is an attempt to change all of your users, that bad word, into an IDS, into someone who actually wants to help you. So how, we, how do we do that? First, let's take this, this incident program, the security incident program, where someone reports a, a problem and they don't get any feedback, or they report a problem and you say, okay, I'll take care of it, and turn it into something more of a game. So um, I believe there are a couple people with, that are talking about gamification of, of different programs, and I'm stealing their thunder right now. Um, but let's turn this into a reward program where the top users, the people who report all of these phishing exercises or the, these, uh, these attempts at uh, breaking into your organization, get something out of it. So you say, hey, CSO, CEO, could you send off this email to the company real quick? Because getting recognition from the CEO of the company that they were the, the top three people in the organization that reported security vulnerabilities matters it starts making it into a game. It starts making it into like the greedy selves that we all are and saying, hey, I want to be recognized. I want to be recognized. I want to be the guy at the top. And then you give them a $100 gift card, a $50 gift card, something more than $5. As long, if, it's, if it's a $5 gift card to Starbucks, no one's going to care. So once you do that, once you make it into a game, once you make it recognizable, something that responds, you start making it in where every single employee is an IDS, where someone wants to tell you about the bad things that are happening in your organization. And finally, the think, uh, quarterly think evil games. Now, I know all of you didn't just start into security. Um, you came out of college and were like, yeah, I'm going to be a uh, senior pen tester at company X. No, we were all IT guys or, or or different, you know, different positions in those companies at some point. And we all found ways 
to get what we wanted. We've all found ways to get to Facebook when it was blocked. We all found ways to get SSH out or my web server so that I can download movies to watch it work. We all found those ways. So this, think, uh, this quarterly Think Evil Games is a one-time, one-quarter deal where you say, if you tell me, if your employees, you tell me about how you got around our security, you, you will not be disciplined at all and we will show you how to do it correctly. You will get a lot of people telling you all of the little things that you didn't know about, that there's a proxy over here in this part of the organization that everyone but you knows about <laughs> that can go out to Facebook. So if you give them that opportunity to tell you without repercussion, or maybe even giving them part of the reward, you start getting more intelligence about your own organization than you normally would. The second crowdsourcing suggestion that I have for you guys is internal bug bounty programs. How many of you have gone to an internal web application or an internal, you know, let's just stick with internal web application, internal web application and put a tick mark and something broke and you went, mm, all right, next. Yeah. So if you have something where someone can report those and say, hey, I found this and it gives me a SQL error. I don't know what this is about, but I think it's bad. Or, or I, put, I put in my password and it said, no, you don't, that's the wrong password. The admin password is this. <laughs> if you have a way for someone to report those things, they will. If you make it part of the game, they will want to report that. They want those gift cards. They want those, those little things that make them more important in their organization. And if you make it easy, the key to this whole thing is making it easy. If you right now do not have security at company.com or spam at, at company.com, you are not making it easy. And if you do, and all it is is a, is a folder in some security guys like inbox that never gets looked at, you're also making it part of the problem. So, oh, real quick, real, real awesome story about that. So we were doing a pen test one time and um, we sent a, a bunch of these phishing emails in and one of the guys clicked on and, and submitted his username and password, but we didn't get any code execution. So we got all of these passwords, usernames and passwords. We were able to log into the, their OWA, but not a single execution came out. So we got onto this one guy's email, and he had sent an email to, an email to the security team saying, is this legit? This looks like you know, a phishing email. And they didn't send anything back. So we sent something back. <laughs> we said, yes, it is. Please click and run it. Five minutes later, we got code execution. It was awesome. So if your security program does not have a response, a human response, then you're part of the problem. Everyone knows this one? This is my favorite vulnerability of all time. I get excited when I see this. Hands down, the best vulnerability of all time, and Microsoft makes it default all the way up to Windows 8.1. The vulnerability is there, the check marks. Automatically configure proxy settings. Yes! You know what that means? Anyone on that network that names their computer WPAD, that's my computer name, and I think most of yours as well. If you name your computer WPAD, guess what happens? Windows will automatically say, hey, WPAD, please give me my proxy settings. And my burp session says, OK, here you go. It's very easy to defend against this. Very easy. And I have no idea why more organizations don't. The simple way is to no route WPAD. Also WPAD, WPAD, WPAD for IPv6. You can disable NetBIOS. That's a great one. NetBio, uh, anyone heard of NBNS, NetBIOS Name Service? This is also a great one. 
you disable NetBIOS complete organization, unless you have Windows 98 still going, you'll be fine. How many organizations in the room want to admit that they have Windows 98 going? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, it's also free to solve this problem. How about DNS? This one everybody doesn't believe me on. This is funny. So DNS, turn it off. In your organization, you can literally turn DNS off. You can say, hey, if it's not Active Directory DNS, don't allow it through. There is no reason why your end user needs to ping Google and it resolve. Your proxy can allow that resolution to happen. So if you have an internal proxy, one, and you can't be transparent, that's the one thing, it has to be non-transparent. If, if you have a proxy, and you should, your proxy can do all that resolution. Now, I stand behind this one because I, I went to an organization to work, and I was going on to a red team, and I, was, I, I thought I was hot crap. I, I thought it was awesome, because I came into that red team, I'm like, hey, look at this new DNS-based Trojan I got. It, it talks all DNS, no one will ever see it. I ran it inside the organization, and guess what it did? Nothing. It did absolutely nothing. Because it couldn't get out. It had no idea how to do resolution. And there are more and more and more backdoors, Trojans, viruses, or whatever you want to call them, doing DNS these days for their command and control. And if you have DNS turned off, it, it takes that entire field of badness out of play. Cool stuff so far? Okay. It's all free. How many people come up to like you at a, at a vendor place or, 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 or a speaker say, and say, all of my solutions are free here? Go to RSA and tell them. I actually tried to present at RSA, and they didn't accept me, and they were like, why are you talking about free stuff? <laughs> so um, this one I'm stealing from Chris, uh, Chris Gates and, and, uh, and Chris Nickerson from Lares. This, this slide is amazing. If you don't have this in your dictionary, then you're, you're, you're not pen testing correctly because one of those will work at every single organization. I, and probably some of you in this crowd are like, that's my password. <laughs> this will work somewhere. At least one account in your organization has this right now. So how on earth do you dump your own hashes? How, how, do you, how do you do password management, or at least, like, how do you handle users selecting bad passwords for everything, including Oracle, account, Oracle accounts, like sys, sys, or uh, database accounts, SA blank? What you need to do is do um, password auditing on all of that. And how do you do it? Get your pen testers involved. I guarantee any pen tester that comes up to you and you pay them and they give you a report and you say at the end, hey, could you do a password audit? They're going to be like, yeah, 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 OK. Because all of us are crazy like that. Because we, we take your passwords and we're like, yes, give us all of them. And, and you're like, uh, I really don't want to. Um, so but honestly, getting off of the, the joke, um, your pen tester, your red team, your, the people who are doing that will jump at the chance to help you audit those passwords. After the pen test is done, just say, hey, I'll let you on my domain controller, dump the hashes, tell us, like, let me know what accounts you, you can crack in 15, 20 minutes, and they will lock it out and, and um, reset it and tell the users that they're dumb. So John the Ripper is the great one, rock you to do that. Um, this one I don't really talk about too often or, or too much because if you're at the point in your organization where you're, where you're thinking about honeypots, you are way, way in front of the game. But if you do want to talk to your CSO about honeypots and, and, and um, CEXO about honeypots, normally they're like, you want to put a vulnerable system in our network? 
and you usually get laughed out the door. One of the ways that I've seen places um, do this, though, is on their perimeter, they set up a port for the NAT rule. It says, hey, if you're coming into my main web server, and my main web server is only port 80 because all it is is news about stuff, but I don't really care about other stuff. If you're coming into it over SSL, 443, I'm at, I will port forward it out to a Linode or, or another VPS and have that running like an old version of WordPress. Now, the bad guy thinks that they're hitting your main web server over SSL, but they're actually hitting some VPS somewhere and you never have to uh, let your uh, organization be compromised or put a vulnerable system anywhere near it. <laughs> All right. So we've, we've blocked all of the DNS problems. We've blocked all of the memory corruption problems. We've blocked all of the Java problems. What about all of your users that still go through the proxy, or that go through the proxy, and all of the domains that are bad? And all of the, the, the malware that is proxy aware? Well, authenticated splash proxies are one solution to that. Now, what is an authenticated splash proxy? Anyone know? Authenticated splash proxy. So authenticated splash proxy basically is, is a proxy that you have to authenticate to that has a special splash page on every single domain. I'll show you in a second how that works. But if you have, if you have um, a requirement for authentication, Please, 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 don't make it automatic. If you make the proxy take NTLM or base authentication or any other authentication that Windows can do automatically, so can I. If your proxy can take authentication automatically, so can the attacker. It's literally one line of code inside of C to make it happen. You can say, use cache credentials, done and it'll do it. So make it, make it a web form, make it something username and password, and you'll be good. This is what I mean by authenticated splash proxy. So once you authenticate, have a little splash page like this, and this splash page does something important. It actually creates a domain white or blacklist. So you can say, hey, First person into work goes to google.com and they get this. And it says, hey, do you want to allow this for the entire company? Most people will shy away from that very quickly. If they're like on Facebook and they're like, do you want to allow this for the entire company? Uh, no. You're going to pornhub.com. Do you want to allow this for the entire company? Mm, no. So out of this, you actually get awesome intelligence. Well, Chris might do it, but whatever. Um, you get awesome intelligence. You get to know who's actually unblocking these things. You're getting a dynamic domain block list automatically set by all of your users. Now, will any C2 on the planet know how to use this, especially if it's Flash? Not a chance. The great thing is, if you, if you click the unblock button, it's red, it looks like a bad thing, it's psychologically freaking your users out. <laughs> if you have the block button, it actually doesn't really do anything. You're not allowing your users to say, block all of this, right? So it's just a placebo on that side. But how do you do that? Like, how, how often do you remove everything? So in the company that I work for that actually had this, this list was refreshed every day. Now, going into work and having to click unblock every single time you want to go to Google or, or anything like that sucks. But if this is a company-wide list, that makes it much more manageable. So if someone goes in and says, hey, unblock Google, and then Google.com is unblocked for everyone. Then someone goes in and says, I'm going to Facebook, they're the first one. Now, at the organization I work for, it was daily. That's little, little too much for some people. Um, they don't want it to, to hinder stuff. 
Well, the great thing about this is that it, it blocks ads too, automatically. But um, uh, the organization that I work for um, recently actually put this in place for um, every month. So this block list gets completely wiped out every month, and you get awesome statistics on it. Cool stuff? Eh, eh, okay. Well, this is where everybody actually starts uh, having fun. So these are the evil canaries. Honey pots are hard. Honey pots you have to monitor. Honey pots you have to look through and analyze. Evil canaries you don't. So all of these are ways that me or a friend that has told me this story have gotten caught. Now, how many pen testers do you know that tell you exactly how they got caught? Right. Um, so, domain user, domain admin temp. So I was on a, I was on a, a pen test and we get on, got in and the, I got a list of domain users and we're like, domain admin temp, awesome. And then in, in, the, in the, the description of it, it said, here's the password for domain admin temp. Done, I am game over. I'm done with this pen test first day. Tried logging into it. Again, again. Again, I tried logging in like 10 times. Nothing was going on, nothing worked. Because it's log on hours in Windows in Active Directory were set to zero. It could not log in at any point in of the day. It, it said active, I looked, and the domain account was active. It was not locked out, so I tried logging in more. And the domain, the actual domain admin guys and the security guys were over in a corner going. <laughs> Um, the second one really pissed me off, though. So I was, I was doing the pen test, went off, looked, I uh, found this share called Password Audits. I'm like, yeah, game on. And then I was allowed into the share. So I went into the share, and there was this, this uh, Excel document. It was four megs. I'm like, game over. I got it. Double-clicked it. Nothing happened. Okay. Tried to download it. Nothing happened. It says access denied. What do you mean access denied? I'm a local admin. How is it access denied? Copy again. Well, in Windows, if you put a deny rule on it, it overrides any authenticate, uh, real rule on it. So how many times, just as a guess, how many times do you think I clicked on that stupid thing? <laughs> yeah, probably a thousand times. So again, the security guy in the corner is going, <laughs> because Every time that I tried to access that file, they had one rule in, in place that said, if file, is a, uh, temp, uh, file access is attempted, log directly to the, the uh, security manager. Because no one should ever be clicking on that. So they set it and forgot it. They just let it go and, and, and never had to worry about it. Never had to even think about it past the one time they had to set up those rules. Second one, or the third one, um, was, was a backup database that had an out-of-date MySQL on Windows. Now, if anybody knows about MySQL on Windows, basically, that's, that's gold. That's game over, pen test, done. Because on Windows, the plugin directory for MySQL is usually completely unguarded. So you can load up any kind of plugin, any kind of DLL you want. So as soon as I saw that, I was like, awesome, game over. So I logged in, authentication worked, great. But it didn't give me any kind of prompt. I'm like, it just logged in and then dropped me back to my shell. I'm like, okay, that was weird. Tried logging in again, back to the prompt. What happened? So I tried logging in again and again and again and trying to figure this thing out and kept trying to log in. What had happened was, the security admin had set this up on just a, a Raspberry Pi, or not a Pi, uh, on, a, on a Windows VM, and removed the DLL for the authentication piece. So this was just a, a MySQL box just running out there with the, the DLL that was needed for authentication or, or going past authentication off of it. So no one could ever log into this thing successfully. So what he did was he logged every attempt to log in and send it directly to the security manager. Set it and forget it. That's one of the cool things about Evil Canaries is like you just put these things in place and every pen tester slash attacker on the planet will go after them with a hunger. 
Uh, this one was funny. Uh, a web developer thought it was hilarious that he made all of his, uh, all of the custom scanners, like Nikto and, and uh, Acunetics and all of the web scanners, reply with a 402. Basically means it's like, pay me. If you want to break into my web application, you need to pay me. It was really annoying. Um, so the great thing about this, this specific HT access file that did this was that it correlated all the attempts and said, hey, this looks like Nikto, and send it off the IP address and everything off to the security manager. So obviously I was caught. Anyone ever been to getcreditcardnumbers.com? Everybody's like, I'm not admitting that. <laughs> um, so it's actually a great website that generates fake numbers for you to use in test data. So this one organization took their payment processing database, this big honking clustered system, and put one extra database name in there. They put credit card numbers as the database name. Now, every, other sing every single other database in that database, or in that whatever computer, had credit card numbers, but this one, like real credit card numbers, this one was called credit card numbers. So as soon as I got access to their credit card processing database, I was like, cool, let me look, okay, ZX501, whatever is that, like, I have no idea what these are. Oh, credit card numbers, that's the one I want. So I, as soon as I accessed that credit card number database, I saw a bunch of credit card numbers that were generated by this stupid website, Get logged in, and I'm like, Game over, send off the report. Security admin's like, thanks for the report. Credit card numbers, huh? Where'd you get them? Oh, yeah, great. Uh, we saw you and we alerted on you and um, those aren't real credit card numbers. Uh. So um, anyone ever use a Juniper a VPN? Even use it? Yeah, so this, there's this, the, um, the website for it is pretty basic. It's like username, password, or pin code and password, and, and stuff like that. Well, normally I, I put things mostly through Burp, and I look at how they work so that I can try and figure out other things around them. So I put uh, access to this Juniper firewall, or this Juniper VPN, through Burp and saw username, default username and password. So I'm like, I just found the default username and password for all of Juniper fire or VPNs? Yes! No, what had actually happened was the HTML source for that page was edited by the VPN admin to catch bad guys. So as soon as you were able to log into that, like it was actual username and password that you could use. As soon as you logged into that Juniper VPN, it didn't give you access to anything. It automatically alerted the security uh, manager and I was caught. Like they were like, block IPs automatically done, like oh, all over. So. That pissed me off. Yeah. Um, and this one, this one was really annoying. So we sent off a fish, in, a phishing email, off to this uh, organization, and we had another guy doing web applications. So we sent off the fish, got 10 um, username and password for this organization, and we were like, yes, we were winning. We didn't get any code execution, but you know what? The web application guy said he found a place that you can log into the domain using the web application. Like, awesome, let's try out these username and passwords, see if they work. We tried it out, it's a success. Okay, cool, that one works. Tried it out, so it's success. Awesome, that worked. We tried all 10 of those and saw if those usernames and password worked. And then we tried an 11th one, just to see, you know, guess if, uh, uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that. I can't see, there's two that spoke. Um, <laughs> if the username and password worked. And that one worked too. It was like, wait, okay, let's try uh, one more. Let's try Bob at, you know, and, and the password Bob. That one was successful too. How did that work? So what, it, what had happened was the, domain, the, the web application guy had created a page that said, you know, here's how to log into the domain. And every single one of those phishing, uh, uh, Usernames and passwords that we had were automatically disabled by that web application when I used it. 
So yes, you can manipulate that if you knew how to use it, if you knew that that's what it did, but we didn't know how, what, it, what it was doing. And we were caught like instantly because they had, they had found all of the, the uh, usernames and passwords that we had fished. They found the fish that we'd used because they, they traced it all back. And we were, we were game over before we even got to use those usernames and passwords once. So, um, wow, that was loud. Um, so there was another one where there was a machine. And this machine was listening on, on 23. And everyone knows what 23 is? Telnet. So it was listening on 23, um, and as soon as anyone talked to that thing on port 23, it automatically alerted someone, because any, any full TCP connection. And this is actually a story from the team I'm on, um, where, where we were caught by this, and um, because we were caught, and because the, the guy was so great, we actually hired him onto the red team. It's better to have a, uh, a colleague than an adversary and someone like that. So finally, um, those are all fun, those are all how you can get caught, those are all things that you can set and forget, right? But one of the things that we, we, we do too much forgetting is that the help desk usually knows more than we do as security guys. The help desk is usually the people who get all the stupid calls about phishing, about, about their passwords being used in places, or about them being disabled, and we rarely, rarely, rarely talk to the, secure, the help desk about um, what they're seeing, what they are, you know, they're experiencing high volumes of calls because of X, Y, Z. So let's stop leaving them out of the loop. Let's use the help desk as part of our security infrastructure. And that is it. Thank you very much. And if you want to see more about me, you can find stuff there.